What's up, YouTube? Welcome to this part two of gRPC. While the first part was more generalized or abstracted from .NET C Sharp, this part is, and the following parts are very specific to .NET C Sharp. So today is the getting started, and I'm sort of saying getting started in a way that it's not the simple greeter kind of service that you will see. I'm going to be covering quite a few more details, which I think are going to be important moving forward in the, in the next parts. And I'm going to be talking about some specific performance enhancements of gRPC in .NET. But then as the parts go along, maybe one or two more parts, I can't imagine there's many, going to be many more than that. I'm going to get to the point where we're going to be talking more real world production quality code and what to and how to do this stuff and where to write this code and things of that nature. So today is the basic, nonetheless, the service is not basic. It's not like the standard greeter service that you see and people talk about, including the Microsoft documentation. There are things you're going to get your trip over if you don't, if you just follow the greeter service. <laughs> and so this getting started is going to be more real worldish. And then and the following parts will be even more towards production code. All right. So starting with performance. You should know, if you don't want to know anything else, gRPC performance in .NET Core and .NET Framework 5, .NET 5, I guess, is out of this world. The performance that the team has been able to achieve as compared to other platforms like C, C++, Go, Java, is phenomenal. Most of the benefits have actually come from the fact that we have in .NET Core or .NET Framework, .NET 5, a completely managed framework built in .NET 5, for .NET 5, while other languages, some of them, use the gRPC C, as in C, C language core, and others like Java, Go, and um, Dart, I'm looking at the slide here, <laughs> have their own core that's built from their own language. So the .NET 5 core, <laughs> gRPC core, and the .NET core 3.1 plus gRPC core <laughs> are built in fully managed code. There are some pros and cons, but mainly pros and fewer cons that even allow for this whole cross-platform idea and the ability to get that performance cross-platform. So just wanted to keep that in mind. This slide is from the previous video. If you haven't seen the previous video, I'll put a link to it over here. So just to reiterate here, as you can see from the slide, JSON versus protobuf or protocol buffers, the size difference between a JSON serialized data packet going across the wire and a protobuf or protocol buffer packet going across the wire. The protocol packet buffer or protobuf's packet size of the data going across the wire is a third to a quarter that of JSON. And then that's almost obvious. There are some things to understand here. I'm going to talk a little deeper, uh, just a little bit deeper. <laughs> As I'm showing you the .proto file, so you understand one of the reasons why this file is so small, because it's binary serialized, which is already going to be smaller. All right, so there's that difference. The second part is that gRPC, the framework, the .NET Core or .NET Framework framework, <laughs> is 25% faster than the sort of MVC part of things, right? the Web API, MVC, all of that. That's not the reason you should be using it. It's just the way it's been implemented makes it that much faster. So it's all pre-compiled code, whereas in Web API and MVC, they do things like at runtime to do the dispatching, as we call it, to dispatch to the different controllers and actions and to hide it, the data. Here's serialized, deserialized in gRPC as binary, but there's no unknowns. It's already pre-known, right? It's all strongly typed and things like that. So it's faster in that sense. Since gRPC has this idea of bidirectional streaming, if you don't know what that is, please look at the video link to earlier. It's not a fair fight, if you will, to compare Web API to gRPC, but using gRPC bidirectional streaming, that's 140% faster than MVC Web API. Okay, so that's a huge difference there. If your application requires it, I'm not saying you should be moving to gRPC for performance reasons. Certainly, I do think it's the future, whatever that means to you. <laughs> 
you it's almost like how XML kind of died a slow death. I think JSON will eventually kind of die a slow death just because it's just way, way too verbose and uh, loosey-goosey, right? I mean, you didn't, you realize after you've made a request that there's something wrong with the request. And similarly, when you get a response, you have to, after the response, have to figure out if you've got the right data, which is not necessarily the best way to go, especially for internal applications, internal to your organization services. Go, the language, Golang, as we call it, or Go, its gRPC core is considered one of the fastest implementations. It's, I think, neck and neck with C, if not faster. I don't really remember. Anyway, the .NET 5 gRPC core, that box that I showed you earlier, <laughs> is neck and neck with the Go version of it. In some cases, it exceeds the performance. In some cases, slightly slower. But net net, they're both on, on, on par. And that's something to be said about, not just because we are .NET programmers. I think the team has done some phenomenal things. Some of these things are nothing to do with gRPC. They started when .NET Core started, you know, the split between .NET Framework and .NET Core, mainly the TCP stack. And a lot and a lot of improvements have been made over the TCP stack and the pipeline, which essentially deals with parsing. So. If you imagine the TCP stack and all the memory management that has to occur, receiving bytes and accumulating data and parsing that data, that's the area where the biggest improvements have come in .NET Core and of course in HP, HTTP2 implementations and therefore gRPC. So what gives us these performance results is of course HTTP2 as I explained in the previous video, the whole, all the benefits with HTTP2 binary framing, multiplexing, full duplex, all of that. HTTP compression, header compression. Here we have HTTP client. That's the uh, .NET HTTP client. It has seen some phenomenal improvements with regards to reduced latency in connections and allocations. But it's also basically coming due to the HTTP2 implementation improvements and improving concurrency within the HTTP client, right? The HPAC compression is the, if you watched the first video, I said there's a, it's not gzip or zlib, it's HPAC. <laughs> so if you come here after that video, it was HPAC that I was forgotten the name of. HPAC is another kind of compression. It was essentially, it came about because of some security issues with uh, gzip and or g, g, z, z lib or gzip <laughs> compression and so H hpac is the new compression it's nothing to do with protobufs or G grpc itself but that's what uh, grpc uses to compress the http headers in http2 keep alive pings allow the client and server to stay in touch and so we don't have to keep reestablishing the connection even though they're not really having a conversation. If the client requires the connection to stay alive, the client can send a keep alive ping and the server will respond. The next step, something that's ongoing, or this is work in progress, is starting to include or use the span of T feature we introduced, I think in .NET 7. Again, this is a performance feature that was introduced in the language where we're allowed to essentially see a window within an array. So rather than when you're parsing to see a subset of an array and have an allocation occur because you need the subset. The span allows you to just look into that data without creating a subset. Essentially, the lack of or the need to not have to allocate while you're parsing byte arrays or strings is where the benefits are coming. You know, fewer allocations, therefore fewer garbage collections. And so they're looking at the, the protobuf team, the protocol buffers team, not the .NET C Sharp team, is working with the .NET team to see if they can include the span of T feature of .NET in the parsing logic of the protobuf serialization feature. So there's a two teams working together trying to get that improvement. And once that happens, we could probably get some more benefits in the whole performance deal there. From the previous video, I mentioned that the transport layer is pluggable, currently using TCP IP. Tomorrow it could be quick, if you remember. Well, other transports are also possible, like uh, as you can see on the slide, named pipes and the Unix domain sockets. 
these are inter-process communications mechanisms have been around for many, many years. Way even before I started programming, <laughs> I remember looking into that and using it in one of the first few programs that I built. And so in Windows, we have name pipes on Linux, Unix, we have the Unix domain sockets. Essentially, these are inter-process communications protocol, meaning within the same machine, if two processes want to talk to each other, almost like TCP-ish, client-server-ish, it's two-way, bi-directional, you can use name pipes. Now, SQL Server, if you, if you install SQL Server, SQL Server and uh, SQL Server Express, the local edition, both have the feature or ability to use named pipes instead of TCP. And if you want, you can try it, switch it over to using named pipes. And of course, your connection string from the .NET side will also have to change. You will see a market improvement in performance because named pipes are literally just allocating a uh, memory on the machine, common area, so that both parties can write to these pipes you know, of memory. So it's literally in memory for both parties. There's no socket involved. Anyway, so that's a feature that's, I think, already in place. I haven't tried it yet. I might, you know, before the end of the series, if I get the, the chance, I'll look into the name pipes feature and make a video on that. But it's there. It's a feature. It's nice to have. Oops, missed one slide. Just a quick note. This is also important. Um, a, GRPC requires HTTP2. So anything you do, any platform you plan to use on, the first thing you have to make sure is that that platform, the web servers, things of that nature support HTTP2, without which GRPC is not going to function. So as a result, there are some limitations, as you can see here. Only our .NET Core 3X and .NET 5 support GRPC on the operating systems side of things. We need to require IS if you're using IS, then IS needs to be on this Windows build, blah, 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 and your application needs to be .NET 5. IS also depends on the kernel mode driver called HTTP Sys, and that requires a minimum Windows build of that. These are not recent builds, so it's not something that you might have to be worried about, but nonetheless, be aware that there are these limitations. In Azure, the cloud services don't support gRPC, App services also, I think, only supports uh, gRPC web. That's one of the things I'll try and get to in the future videos. gRPC web is different from gRPC. Um, I don't think Azure has a really good story. Uh, AKS, the Kubernetes uh, containers do support gRPC. But if you're not in Kubernetes, then you're not getting gRPC, which is unfortunate by this point. I'm, you know, I'm, oh, I was hoping that Microsoft had their act together where multiple teams can work in parallel and get to an endpoint and then have it all available. <laughs> anyway, now we'll move on to the project. All right, so I'm simply going to start a select from this type of project. It's called the ASP.NET Core gRPC project, just plain Jane. We'll create it plain Jane and then we'll modify it. So I'm just going to call it, uh, just, let's call it, movie grpc service if need be i'll also make this video the code base already available on my github and if i do then i'll put a link in the description below so if you are interested in the code of course remember this is dotnet 5 if you are interested in the code then look at the link uh, sorry in the description if the link is there you can go get the code if i've forgotten the link <laughs> please remind me Okay, so notice that's .NET 5. As you can see, this is standard ASP.NET Core. We have our startup. We've got our program CS. These, the code here uh, is identical to what you would expect. Nothing special here. All right. It is an ASP.NET Core application. What they have done is they've included in the startup, you can see here, they've added gRPC. Okay, so if you want to use gRPC, you need to say services.add gRPC. And then make sure yeah, you do this after user routing and within the endpoints, because these two are required to be in this order. That's then you have to do the user routing before you do the use endpoints anyways. So I'm just kind of reminding you there. 
within the endpoints, you have to set up a mapping for your GRP service. In this case, it's called, it's called greeter service. So you need, if you have multiple services, just add multiple lines here to get the GRPC service uh, framework to start routing to or dispatching to your service if the requirement, if the request is coming or headed for your service. That's really what it's doing. Just this feature is just saying, hey, I'm here as a GRPC service, and if you get any requests, please hand them to me, for me, not for somebody else, right? This is a standard HTTP endpoint. In case you're using gRPC only, then this is a basic reminder, as you can see from the comment here, if you try and access this service using just standard HTTP, then it's gonna give you this information, error message, right? So that's the change, add the service, add the mappings, if you have multiple services, add multiple mappings. Okay, now let's look at some of the files that were generated here. In the Protos folder, this, these are conventions that the project system follows, and I suggest you follow the same. In the Protos folder, we have a greedy, greet greet.proto file, and in the services folder, we have a greeter service. All this is code gen for you. If you remember from the previous video, the proto file is our IDL or the interface definition language that gRPC uses to communicate the, the service. So I have a proto file for my service. I publish that proto file. I hand it to you. I email it to you. Whatever I do to it, I can send it to you in some form or fashion and make it available to you in some form or fashion, even through a URL endpoint. And then that describes for you the service I am publishing, and then you can use Visual Studio and that proto file to generate a client for my service, right? Kind of like SOAP used to do with the WSDL, or you do now with Swashbuckle Open API, all right? All right. Now, one of the things I want to mention here is that when this, each time this proto file is modified, the code generation functionality in Visual Studio will regenerate some classes that are auto-generated for you that pertain to this dot proto file. The classes I'm talking about are the classes that are generated here. So these are this these classes are all code generated. So we'll get to that. I don't want to spend too much time with the greeter part. We are going to change this to another uh, proto file with different services and different uh, inputs and outputs, and then we can talk about that, okay? So, let's do that. So, we have now a service called movie service that has one method called get movies that takes an argument and returns an argument. This is standard for all gRPC methods have to take exactly one argument and they have to return exactly one argument. So in this case, it's taking nothing effectively. This empty is a what we call a well-known type. In gRPC, there are different types. Some are scalar types that are documented as part of the protocol buffers thing. And then there are well-known types that are not quite part of the normal. They are like an extension, if you will. And Google has defined a few well-known types, the empty being one of them. But there's also equivalence to our .NET types, um, daytime offset, timestamp, and daytime. All right, so, but they're not defaults in the protobus, but they're well-known types. And so when you use some other definition, you can define your own too. You will import that here. So we are importing this, in this case, Google protobus empty.proto, and that's where that is coming from, all right? The namespace is important, not so much because it's important, it's just the, this, the naming of this I found with the protocol and the code generation and things is a bit out of control. And so you've got to name things correctly, otherwise it's going to be really, really confusing. And I'm guessing you're going to find that out pretty quick. So in this case, the namespace is very intentionally grpc.services. All right, this will be become the C sharp class namespaces, if you will. And to sort of separate out, your normal namespace, let's say you're from your project, from the code gen things, I suggest having a different namespace for these code generated classes and, and types so that there's no confusion, right? And don't name it like your main project, <laughs> like in this case, grpc.movies or something. That's just get too confusing, okay? The service of call is, is the movie service. So that we are leaving that that way. 
the movie response is here. And the movie response is nothing but a class or a message that contains, <laughs> sorry, not class, it is translated to a class. But this is a proto message that contains a field called movie. So the, the field is called movies of type movie repeated, meaning it's just like an array or a collection of this movie type. These, the, the placeholder, the position numbers here, field positions are important. I'll get that. I'll get to that in, in a bit. The movie message has a title property of type string. This is a proto buff type, not a C sharp type. These are all proto buff types. Another property called image URL, which is also of type string. A year property that's of type in 32. This is also proto buff in 32. It's not the uppercase I, by the way. You just notice that. This is proto buff in 32. And a property called genre, which is of type genre, which is an enum, which is defined here. The Field in indices of field positions there are important because in gRPC, when we serialize data in binary, unlike in JSON and XML, we always serialize like the name and the value, like the field name and the value, the field name and the value. And if you have a million records that are being sent across the wire, then the same field name is being repeated a million times with maybe a different value, but the field name is the same, right? With protobufs, what they've said is, if you and I are talking and we both know the protocol in which we are talking. So I want to send you this message. Let's say this movie message. You already know the movie message because you've got the profile too. So you know when I send you a movie, that field one is title. So I don't need to send you the name of the field. I can just send you the value. In position one, I send you the value. You know it's title because <laughs> you and I are working off of the same contract, the same IDL, the same interface definition language. So it saves a lot of time. I mean, if you have to send 10 records back, you don't have to keep repeating the word title, 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 title 10 times. And for every field, right? This is what JSON and um, XML do. Right now, BSON, I think, binary serialization JSON does something similar, but anyway, I'm talking about just the binary serialization. So the position numbers are important because you can, if you wanted, to add more fields in the future to still remain backward compatible. If you don't want the property in the future, remove it but don't renumber the fields. So if you remove number one, field number one, remove it. Don't rename the others. You know what I'm saying? So leave the field numbers alone, or position numbers. Add more if you want. Remove old ones if you want. Just don't touch the things, the, the, the numbering. The numbering cannot be changed to remain backward compatible. Okay, so that's the importance of that. Importance of that. Okay, so here's our service. So we want to implement the service. I'm going to go about just changing a few things here. I'm going to change this file to be called movie service dot proto. The proto file, movie service dot proto. And I want to change this greeter service to movie service dot proto, the CS file here. Okay. Okay. Now I'm just going to remove this and I don't care for this method. Okay. So that's, I don't really care for that. Again, notice that. Because this is feeding off of the standard .NET Core, ASP.NET framework, it has access or you have access to dependency injection and all the other features, configuration, dependency injection, everything that comes as part of the package in ASP.NET is available to you in gRPC services as well. You're wondering why I'm talking about in dependency injection. I just saw it there. I don't necessarily use it, but it's there. So I'm letting you know. Okay, so now, here's the part I want to talk about the generated files. So I'm going to navigate to the file folder for this project. Well, while I'm here, I can show you some of the things that changed when we, or was created for us when we created a service, gRPC service, a reference to the proto file, and the fact that we want to generate the server code for this app, this project here. The, you can have server, client, both, and so on. I'll show you that later. And that's the library that's required for the is gRPC feature for ASP.NET, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna to navigate to the folder of this project. Hmm. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the OBJ folder, not the bin, so it's OBJ folder, debug, .NET 5, proto. Here, I'm just gonna delete this. That's because it's going to get confusing now. We have greet and movie service files here. Okay, so I'm going to delete those files. 
All right, now I'm going to go to the proto file here. And let's say I make a change here. I've got a typo and I save. Go back to that folder, nothing here. Right? If I remove the typo and save, go back here, you'll see the files just got created. So anytime you modify the proto file, I suggest you delete these files that are being generated so you know there's no other way to tell if you have made a mistake. And typos are pretty simple to make. No squiggles, no code formatting, nothing on the proto files yet in Visual Studio. So if you make a mistake, you won't know you made a mistake. So what I suggest is get to this folder, this uh, obj folder, the proto file uh, folder, delete these files, make the changes, hit save, and you will see the files generated. If they are generated, the proto file is fine. If there are any issues with the proto file, syntactically or otherwise, those files not, will not be generated, so you know there's a mistake. All right? So that's what I did here. Now I'm going to open this file here, the movie service grpc.cs. Not the other one, that's just called movie service. And you can see it's all code generated over here. Notice our namespace, grpc.services, and then the class name, movie service. So that's coming from our proto file, isn't it? That's the namespace. And that's the movie service, right? Okay. But notice this class is static, which means you're not going to be creating an instance of this class. However, this class has a nested class here. So this is a nested class. It's not static, and it's called movie service base. This is our services base class. So the way you're going to reference that class is, of course, namespace dot outer class name dot inner class name. <laughs> All right, let's try that. So this class descends from grpc dot services dot movie service dot movie service base. That's how you get to that. Now I don't like such long winded names. I'm gonna just alias this so I can use just this much. Okay. All right. So there we have it. The class we want to implement on the server side has to descend from the code gen class. Okay. And so the implementations are up to us, but the, there's a lot of plumbing that's done. You can look at those classes yourself. There's a huge amount of code that is generated by the, the code generation of grpc for .NET. Um, not the easiest code to read, but nonetheless, it's all required. We need to just focus on our descendant class here on the service and implement the methods that we want. So in our case, if you were to just try and override some methods, you'll notice that we have a method called get movies that we can override. And here, uh, let me just put this into namespaces. Remove some of the clutter. Okay, so we have a movie called, sorry, a method called get movies that returns a task of movie response. And if you remember, movie response has a property called movies that contains the collection, right? The task returning just allows us to do these things asynchronously. So the async modifier is not ever part of the signature of the method. Task has, is a part of the signature of the method. Whether you make that, implement that method asynchronously or not is up to you, but you, it's not considered part of the method signature. In other words, because we're overriding, we don't know if the parent method had the async modifier on that method or not, and it doesn't really matter. Okay, so our job here is to implement this. So we can, in one sense, we can say, okay, we have a uh, movie response. And this is nothing but a new movie response. Right? This movie response has a movies property here. This is a collection, and this is of type, as you can see here, of repeated field of movie. The way the class is implemented, this movie response, you don't have the ability to replace the entire collection. You can assign the collection. You can add to the collection. All right? So just keep that in mind. So here, we can add. Right? So you can say movies.add. Just do want. Okay. And here we can uh, add a movie. 
right? And once we add all the bunch of movies that we want, we can then finally have a return, this, uh, the response, right? We can do that. And that's that. Now this is a task returning method. This is, this is not a task. So for, for here we just do a, you know, task dot from is from result. Okay, and do that. And that's that. I'll just implement the, these methods better so we get some actual movies back. There you go. All right. So I've just added uh, title 0134, year 0134, and so on, just to keep it all unique. And we uh, yeah, have a sci fi. We have that sci fi. Okay. So server size implemented. What about the client? For the client, we'll add another project to the same solution. This is just going to be a standard console application, nothing fancy. So we just add a new project. It'll be a console application. Remember, it'll be .NET 5, once again, just for the tooling purposes. Now, when we create a client or application that is proto-related or gRPC-related, then the idea is to get that proto file. How do we get the proto file? There's many ways to get the proto file. In these projects, it's a project reference. Okay? You can, in, if, in an organization, you can have a, uh, a service that the entire enterprise uses, for example, that's a discovery service, discovery of all services. Just like that hub where you go and discover all the services you have, and people can search and look for services, and once they find the service, you can make available that proto file as a URL, as a file, what do you want to choose? So here we're going to just use our own project. We're going to use this project's proto file in this project, and in the client project, we're going to use the server project. So I'm just going to say add uh, service reference. Here we have an option for open API or gRPC. We'll pick gRPC, and the file is going to be the file from the service in the proto folder. There, you could use the URL if you wanted. We are choosing to generate the client code using the proto file. The server side uses the server option. You can have to use client and server or messages only, which is just the messages, but not the actual service itself. Meaning the details, but not the <laughs> movie service, but the movie message. Installs a bunch of packages, NuGet packages, that are required for the client side, as well as for the code gen pieces. So client factory, gRPC client factory, GFC tools, of course, and then protobuf. Okay, so it's done all that for us. Close that out. So, our client application is now attempting to or wants to connect to the service. Remember that whole namespace thing I talked about, grpc.services.movieservice. That's going to be important here as well because it's the same proto file. All right? And the class we want is going to be that name in this project. So I'm just going to build this project just to make sure those other files in this project's obj folder are created. All right? They're slightly different place. Let's look at where they are. So navigate to this projects folder. And go to OBJ, go to debug, go to .NET 5. And there's no proto file here, a folder, sorry. But those files are here, so they're here. So if I were to delete these files, okay, come back to the client application, do a rebuild, and come back here, you'll find, uh, well, I should probably do a rebuild, post the rebuild. Okay. And it's back. Okay. Same classes, just the client side of the equation. All right. So here, grpc dot services dot movie service dot movie service client. All right. So you want to new up. So a couple of things here, you notice that this requires a either a call invoker or a channel. We want to use a channel. I'm just going to remove this namespaces thing here again, just too long. Okay, so we need a channel. Channel 
in GRPC like a connection. So first we establish a channel between you and me, you and I want to talk, so we establish a channel. That's a big fat pipe because it allows this full duplex, multiplex conversation, right? I can send you multiple pieces of data at the same time, multiple channels, multiplexed. You can send me multiple channels and we can have this both full duplex conversation going on as if you're really smart to be able to talk on, you know, multiple languages at the same time. <laughs> That's what GRPC allows for. And so this channel, GRPC channel, GRPC channel, which is obviously in the core, GRPC net core. And from here we can say from address. And the from address would be the address of the server. I know it to be HTTPS localhost. I think port 5001. We'll have to check. It doesn't work. Okay, so this is our gRPC channel. And the constructor here requires the gRPC channel. And that's that. Now on the gRPC channel, we should have our method get movies. It produces two methods. We had a get movies method defined. It produces the synchronous version and the asynchronous version. So I'm going to use the asynchronous version here, right? Because typically the asynchronous version also gives you more scale, not performance, more scale. <laughs> don't know what that is please take a look at my other video i made many 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 years ago on async await in c sharp 5 dot net 4 5 4.5 so take a look at that i'm trying to explain the idea that it's not performance it's scale scale is not the same as performance okay so this requires an argument which is of type empty so we say new empty now this empty if you remember i mentioned oh, oh see already did that <laughs> it put that in this well-known types namespace I don't need all this stuff here. So let's take that out. So empty is defined in the protobus well-known types namespace. And it comes back to us. This is awaitable methods. We need to await it. Comes back to us with the movie response. Okay, let's do that. So we say movie response is equal to await. And then we have to modify this to be async task returning. Okay, so now that we have a movie response, the movie response has a movies property, which is a collection, right? So we could for each that, there. And now we, we could just print out each movie. So let me just write that code to print out singular movies from here and let's see all this function. Okay. And here, print movie with this movie. Okay. So the client is ready. By the way, just so you know, we're gonna go add another method, the so streaming method. So this is the simple part of it which is very much like the greeter service, except you're seeing me do it and write it, so you understand some of the underpinnings of this thing. And the next, uh, the next method we implement will be a streaming method. That's going to become a little more complicated, lots of gotchas there, so I want to put that into this getting started piece. All right. Now, for those of you who don't know how to do this, uh, either run a client and a server from the same solution, you essentially go to the solution thing here, and you go to the properties of the solution, that I've kind of right clicked here and not that you saw it, but I right click here. I don't use my mouse, so I forget to tell you. Let me just show you one minute. Okay, like that. Okay, I just hit all enter. I pick multiple startup projects. I want to make the service project run first. I'm going to move that up. I'm going to set it to start and then the client, and set it to start. So both of them will start, service will start first, then the client. Maybe we want to make sure the service will start before the client. And then here, so that this application stays running, let's just do that. Okay. Hit F5 to run, and you should see the service startup, the client startup, and we get all our movies here. So we, on the server side, we returned five, four or five movies. We got the five movies here, right? That's being the display. So this is working fine. This looks like what we would expect. 
the beauty of this is that this server could be on your machine and the client could be on my machine and I could be talking to your machine. I right? provided ports and things of that nature. It's just standard HTTP or HTTP2. Right? So if, you, if I can come in or ngrok, if you haven't seen that video, maybe you want to look at that video, ngrok. I show you how to do that, how to expose an endpoint from your local machine publicly available to anyone. Okay, now next part will be streaming. If you don't know what streaming is, this is about C Sharp async streaming. C Sharp 8 introduced this feature. I made a video on that over here. Please take a look at that to understand what streaming is all about. In this video, I'm just going to keep saying streaming with the assumption that you know what it is. You may not understand what's the big deal about it if you don't know what streaming is. So please watch that video first. All right. So introduce another method here to our proto file. I'm going to go into our services proto file here. I'm going to add one more method here. So what I've done is added a RPC method called get movies stream. Again, this takes an empty, in other words, it's taking nothing. This returns, however, a stream of movie. So rather than returning something that has a repeated movies collection, I'm streaming the movies. So it's not the same thing. Streaming is not the same as returning a collection. But a stream of movie is essentially a collection of movies that comes bit by bit. Not all at once, but bit by bit. Why? Because you just don't have the data at this point. And as soon as you get the data on your end and you send it over to the client, it's considered streaming. This could be a whole day long process. All right. So streaming methods essentially are used for situations where you want to just return the data back to the client as soon as possible, or it's this ongoing long process that just occurs. You know, and as you're getting your data, you want to just stream that data back, you know, all day long, 24 7. There's a connection between your clients and your server, and you're just having this conversation. Anyway, I want to explain the benefits of streaming, but that's what streaming is. Okay, so we need to now implement this method here. Now, as soon as I hit the save on this proto file, you know that the file, the code gen file, will be recreated, and now we'll have another method on it that's for the streaming feature. So let's see what that looks like on the service side. So on the service side, I'm going to look here. And if I try and attempt to override another method, I'll see that I have this movies, get movies stream method now. Okay, and this thing, again, it takes an empty. It doesn't return anything. It has a response stream and a server call context. So these two are the same. It's the response stream that's new. So the response stream is what we will be writing to as we receive the data from wherever this, the implementation would be from a database. As soon as we return, re receive some data from a database, we can be returning that out to the client and the client can do what it needs to do right away instead of waiting for the full set of data. Or we could be re just receiving data from, let's say an IoT device that sends a message every 30 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever it is. And you're returning that data back to the client as soon as you get it. The client is seeing the data, even though they're seeing a single thing at a time, it's a streaming message, right? So we, just, we write to the response stream. Let me show you. Response stream dot write. And the write async takes a movie, as you can see here, right? Takes a movie. So I'm going to put a movie. I'm just going to copy one of these guys here. And do that. Okay. Now this is an awaitable, so I'm going to have to await it, which means also that I need to mark this method with async modifier that it does the task. All right. Now, if I await it here and I repeat this multiple times, let's see all the zeros, you're going to, if you remember the async streaming feature and even the yield return video in, in that family of videos, you'll realize that each time I write this one line of code here, it's going to be seen on the client right away. So the client will see one movie at a time here. Okay, I can show you that by putting a breakpoint on this uh, method's second line. Okay, but let's go and implement this now, this method on the client side. Okay, so on the client side, we have this. And what we want to be able to do now is in our movie service client, we'll have another method 
Oh, we need to rebuild this. Yeah, you see that here. See, it's not showing me the additional methods. Because we haven't rebuilt this project with the new profile. Let's do that. So I'm just going to hit the rebuild. Oh, let me show you here. Come back here. And there you have it. Get movie stream. Right? So that code gen thing is important to understand how it works. And if you make profile changes, make sure you rebuild so you can either see or use the newer feature. So get movie stream. What does it do? It says, well, give me an empty and I'll give you back an async server streaming call of movie. Okay, so let's give it the, the empty. And what it's going to do is return to us a async server streaming call of movie. Oops, open close plan. And once we have that, we have our response stream. And the response stream has methods such as move, next, and current. This looks very much like the get enumerator. It's not an enumerator in that sense, but it's got the same features. But that's so we can use that. We can do a while move next or not while not move next, get current and do that. So I'm going to implement that code. That's the hard way of doing it. I want you to understand it though, because this is a feature in GRPC framework that you will never discover. I know it's there, but what if you don't know about it? I want you to understand how it's going to work. How would you go about doing it? And then we can talk about the stuff. So I'm going to. Write the code here. I may or may not forward fast forward the the code in the editing part, but bear with me. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna say while Okay, and then to the same response stream dot current will give us the current movie. See that? That's a movie. This current is a movie. Yeah, it returns a movie. All right, so it's also an IS async stream reader dot current. So this thing is an IAsync stream reader, the response stream. And keep that in mind, we will be talking about that. Okay, so current. So this gives us a movie. So conceptually, I could just say print the movie, right? That's really what I want to do here. And that's that. What's it complaining about here? Why am I actually putting, wanting to put a not? I just need to put a wait because we're saying move next. I'm so confused. Okay, and another parenthesis here. So while move next, it runs true if it moves next, come here, right? So if you run this client application, it will of course call the first method here. So we'll see like four movies appear or five movies appear first. And then these movies. Now I could put a delay on the service side. So if I went back to our implementation here, I could put like a delay. Okay. Hopefully that's not confusing. I still want the breakpoint on the second stream. So I want to wait after we receive the first one on the client side. All right. Okay, same thing. I'm going to hit FI. It's going to run the client. It's going to run the server first, then the client, and we should see the output. Okay, it'll work. Sometimes you'll see, sometimes you won't see it. So it's not something you can control. There it is. So this time we've seen the data come here. So the first movie's already arrived. This method is not yet completed. It's going to be returning more movies. And if you were to do something like this with the thing here. Okay, so I'm going to step here. You'll see the output coming. It'll always be title zero, all right? So I go step. See, it came here. One more movie came here. Did wait for a second. Step. Wait for a second. Step, and so on. So you're seeing this coming, and that's really what I want to show you is 
this method will take its own sweet time, but as soon as it does the right stream, you're going to see the data here on the client. Okay? All right. So, I'm just going to move all this because there's another plan now. Okay, so two things. First, let's go back to the client here. Uh, here. And I want to rewrite this in such a way that we don't end up doing this stuff like that. Okay, so the idea is that we have in C Sharp 8, we have the await for each feature, right? And this takes an I async enumerable. We have an I async enumerable, but it's sort of embedded in here. So I'm just going to write an extension method, all right, that does that implementation for, you, for us, and then I'll show you how that looks. So it's a simple extension method class. The implementation is also very simple. Uh, async stream reader. Right. Okay. All right. So it's an extension on the async stream reader, returning an iAsync numeral, which then can be used in the forage. And we've got the same implementation we had before, except that instead of writing or printing out the current, we are yield returning the current, all right? Which means, and this is an extension method, so which means here in our, uh, here, implementation here, we can just say, all right, and movie. And here we do the same thing, we print movie. Okay. Now the reason I'm showing you this is that one, it's important to know that all this is really a use very easy to get from a iSync stream reader to an iAsync enumerable by having this sort of implementation. Right. The second thing is that there is now, you see it now, you don't see it before, but you see it now. There isn't read all async method here. This is has only appeared because we've included a certain namespace. And so you see it. The problem with extension methods is that unless you know the namespace, you don't know it exists. You can't discover extension methods. That's the big problem. I have. One of the big problems I have with extension methods is you can't discover it. So what I was really trying to show you is this. In the .NET gRPC libraries, we actually have a method called readAll async. Its implementation would be something similar to this. I'm not quite sure, but that basically that's what it is. So now I can take this out. But the only reason you're seeing it is because I included this namespace that was not there before. So what namespace is it in? Well, let's find out. In case you want to make a note of that. It's in the gRPC core namespace. Now that gRPC core namespace was not in by default, it was not used by default. So you were not going to see that method unless you included the namespace. So now, same thing here. We just got a built in implementation this time, read all async. And on the service side here, I want to rewrite this a little bit. Essentially, do be something like uh, four, 10. In this loop, I'm going to do a response stream dot write async. And here, essentially, I'm going to say new movie. And then there's going to be some properties here, right? So title and so on and so forth. So let me finish up this code. And I'm going to loop through that n number of times. And for each one, I'm writing to the stream. And so we'll see movies appearing one by one. I'll put a delay in there. I just want to use the I in the movie title so we can see the see, iterating over that thing. All right, so let's, uh, let me do that. Put this back here. Okay. So, just using the I here in different places, we can see it all change. Also, by the way, for the genre, I've used the mod six, and there are six elements in the genre, as you can see here on these 
journals. And uh, okay, let's run this. Let's look at the outcome. There's a delay between each iteration, so that'll be that'll look pretty cool here. First six, and then one, two, three. And the different journal. Now, what you didn't see over here, I'm just going to run this again. Pay and put your attention on the server side screen as well. Let me restart this. You'll notice here when it ends the 10 iterations there, you'll see it says executed, right? This one here, executed and then request finished. Till then it had not finished, right? So that's the sort of the beauty of streaming. Now, something about the real world side of things. In the real world, if you have the streaming endpoints, then what if the client disconnects? Do you just keep sending stuff out into ether? <laughs> like what's gonna happen? So in the real world, of course we won't do some for each kind of loop thing, but you still wanna know if the client disconnected. And of course, if you know from the gRPC side, we support cancellation. That is as part of the GR's PC spec. Cancellations are supported, which means the client can let the server know, hey, I want to, I'm canceling, like, you know, just don't keep going. So let's see how we would implement that on the server side. All right. So stop all this here. And over here now, what we want is at this point, we're going to use these server contexts. So this is the first time that we're using this concept here. So the server context has a cancellation token server context dot um, where are we looking cancellation token dot if cancel request so here we can have a while loop instead of a for loop okay so that'll be while not is it requested then do that remove the for loop and replace with the while loop. Uh, but now we don't have an I index here, so let's declare. And here, let's increment. Oops, okay. Same idea, except this loop is now gonna be endless. It's gonna, just gonna keep going. It'll go all day long, all year long, 24, 7, 365, until some disconnection happens, all right? So, or the client cancels. I'm going to show you that now. If I didn't do this, shoot, I should have. Okay, I'm just going to back up here. <laughs> I'm going to undo, go back to the for loop, all right? Okay, we're back here. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to run this application, run the client. So once it's come into the streaming mode here, I'm going to disconnect from the client. Watch the server side code here. There, you got a failed. Right? There was an exception on the server side because the client disconnected. <laughs> Make sense? So this is what we're going to avoid. So I want to now go back <laughs> and implement this. Uh, while loop again. So while uh, context not cancellation dot is cancel requested while not and take all of this code. Oops, not this code, this code and move it up there. And we don't have a indexer. Increment. All right. This time we're going to be sending this data continuously till the client disconnects, essentially. And there should be no errors on the server side when the client disconnects because why? We are looking to see if there's a cancellation requested. Okay, I'm going to start this again. Okay. So this client is. Going to keep running. You watch the server here. See this executing 
endpoint. And that's it. Like that's the last thing is done here. I want this client is going to keep going. Something happens when I click on the the windows here. Oh, there it is now. Okay. So it's moving on, right? It's gone to 25, 26. I'm going to shut down the client. You keep your eye out here. There. It went from executing to executed. So this was the new line added and the request finished. So it was graceful shutdown. But the client told the server that it needs to cancel us ending the connection. All right. I hope this was not too detailed. I thought it was important when I first started with gRPC. I got a bit stuck with the collections, the streaming, all this other stuff that you know the greeter services were not doing. So I'm hoping this has taken you a little further than that. And as I said in the beginning of this video, moving forward, we're going to go more detailed, more real world, more production quality code by the end of this series of videos, probably one, maybe two more videos in this series. So I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned a few things. If you have, please give me a thumbs up and I'll see you next time.